welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord today? Now listen, you didn't come to hear from me. Oh, thank God you didn't come to hear from me. You didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old. This is not about hearing from the black or the white, the brown, or any other color you could imagine. This is about us coming together, preparing our hearts, and hearing from God. Because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches the church. He is the revelator. He is the one that reveals things to us. And so let's not come to hear from a man or a woman. Not, it's not about hearing from somebody. This is about hearing from Jesus, the Holy Spirit speaking to us in his church today. So if you would, let's prepare our hearts. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. And let's go before the Lord in prayer together. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for what you've already done in this church service today. God, your presence is just amazing and, and powerful and magnificent. Lord, we love you. We praise you today and are very grateful that we get to freely come into the house of God. Lift our hands, lift our praise and our worship to you, God. And Lord, just as we sang a moment ago, we would ask that the word of God would come and speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, come and reveal to us from your word a, a, a revelation that each and every one of us can take with us in this place and apply to our individual lives. God, we would ask that as we open up your word that you open us up to receive it. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown today, and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our lives. God, I thank you that you give us the wisdom, the guidance, the vision, the direction that we need for our everyday life, God, and we give you the glory and the honor and the praise for that. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, we don't think of ourselves as any better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together building your kingdom. Lord, we would ask you to bless them as you bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. As you're sitting down, get your Bible out and go with me to the book of Hebrews. We're going to continue our study in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, looking at the same verse, Hebrews 4.12, that we looked at two weeks ago. Pastor Luke did a phenomenal job two weeks ago opening up the Word and talking to us about the importance of the Word of God. And if I can just rem remind you of some of the things that we talked about, we talked about how the, the Word of God has life. And let's read it together, Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. It says these words, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's so much in this one little verse we could really spend weeks and months and even years just digging in and, and finding out what the word of the Lord is all about here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. Last week, we, we talked about the importance of the word of God. We saw the life, the power in the word, that the word of God is, if you remember, inspired, that God inspired men, holy men of God, to prophesy and to write and to, to record the word of God that was spoken to them. And so it was contained for thousands of years, but if God could inspire them to write it back then, that he could also inspire you and I to understand it here and now today. And that was a brilliant understanding from Pastor Luke last week and really from the Holy Spirit of God. And then we saw that not only is it inspired, but it is powerful. That the Word of God is powerful, that it's living, that it's active, that, that it has power. We found out that the Word of God outlasts everything. This is the eternal Word of the Lord. And no opposition, no man or woman, no philosophy, no school of thought is going to stop the Word of God. The Word of God outlasts everything. And finally, last week, we learned that it is the truth. Not what you think, not what I think. Not what a group of people got together and agreed on. No, this is about the word of God. This is the plumb line for our life. This is what we are to line up our lives with. Why? Because it is the truth in the word of God. This week, we're going to focus on some words out of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse number 12, and transition us into another understanding of the word of God. Let's take a look at the verse again. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12 says these words. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Today I want to talk to you about the piercing word of God. 
So we saw in the language of Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, this is a piercing word of God. It uses words like sharp, sharper than any double-edged sword. See, this is no natural thing. This is a spiritual thing. And no matter how sharp you could get something here on the earth, grinding it down and refining it and smoothing it out and making that sharp, listen, the spirit cuts even deeper, cuts even through that. This is a sharp word of God. It's a powerful word of God. And it pierces. It, it cuts through. It breaks through things in our life. Anything that comes against us, any opposition, anything that we could line up with it, it will cut right through that. It will break through that. It will pierce that. And this is a piercing word of God. You know in the, in the Bible that it talks about the word as being a seed. Oftentimes if you look at a natural seed, there is a point on that seed. What is that for? Well, if it falls off of a plant or if it falls out of a tree or something like that, it will hit that ground and it will pierce that ground and dig in. Why? So that it can take root and then eventually produce fruit. The same thing with the Word of God. That as we hear the Word of God, as we read the Word of God, as we speak the Word of God, that it's like that seed that pierces our hearts. It drops in there and it gets deep down on the inside of us. It pierces into our lives. It takes root and then it produces fruit in our lives. Can you say amen? amen. We also see that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. Really, when you look at those words and, and you start to study it out, you find that it talks about it being a double-mouthed sword. It's kind of an interesting statement. What is he talking about? We, we think about double mouth. We think about people talking out of two sides of their mouth. That, that really means hypocrisy. I mean, they're saying one thing on one side and another thing on the other side. That's not what this is talking about. Let's look at, uh, in the book of Revelation, I'll just put it up on the overheads for you. Speaking of Jesus, talks about the apostle John is, is in the spirit and he has a vision and, and there Jesus appears to him and he sees Jesus in his resurrected body as he is now and he sees him and he says this in Revelation chapter 1 verse number 16 describing Jesus. It says, he had in his right hand seven stars. Look at this. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. You say, well, pastor, that's great, but you still haven't explained what two mouth means to me. Well, let's get there, okay? See, Jesus Christ is the living word of God. And God spoke and the word of God proceeded and went forth. That's one mouth. But you and I here on earth side, we have to also speak the word of God. We declare the word of God. And when we do, we are that second witness. We are that second mouth. We come into agreement with the things of God. And when we speak what God has already spoken, now it is two-edged. It is double-edged. It is two-mouthed. And now the word of God pierces through and cuts through. Are you listening today? And so if we're going to have an understanding of the piercing word of God, how it operates and how it works in our life, I'm going to make a statement today. I'm going, to, I'm going to start a sentence and we'll complete that sentence three times today. So if you're taking notes, you can kind of write it down and do a little one, two, three, that sort of a thing and just get a hold of this. Or you can write the sentence out three times if you like doing that as well. But here's the beginning of the sentence. When we use the word, it is. And when I say use the word, I really mean speaking it loud out of our mouth. I really am talking about coming into agreement with the word of God that God has already spoken. Becoming that second mouth, that second witness that's declaring the word of God. So the piercing word of God, when we use the word, it is, number one today, the instrument of breakthrough. When you look at the piercing word of God, number one, when we use the word, it is the instrument of of breakthrough. Think about this. If you are going to pierce your skin, you are going to have to break through layers of skin to get down underneath and find out what's down there. If you're going to go into the earth with a seed, right, you have to break through those layers of topsoil in order to get down. If you're going to mine for gold, you're going to have to break through rocks and all sorts of dirt. You're going to have to dig through a lot of stuff. You are going to have to break through in order to get to where you want to go and to obtain what you need in your life. And therefore, you and I, if we're going to have any sort of breakthrough in our lives, we are going to have to use the word as the instrument of breakthrough. It is the tool that we use in order to get to our breakthrough. And don't tell me you don't want breakthrough in this place. Each and every one of us in our lives have things that we want to get to, have things that we're going through, have things that have tried to stop us, to hold us back, circumstances and people and opposition and life and all sorts of stuff happens. And therefore, we have got to get to a breakthrough. There are things that we want to do, places we want to go, things that we want to do in our lifetime, things that we, we see in the Word of God that we want to have. And therefore, if we're going to get to that breakthrough, we've got to speak the Word. Many times... People are waiting on a breakthrough they could have. 
Let me say that again. Many times, people are waiting on a breakthrough they could have. What do I mean by that? They just need to break through with the word of God. The word of God is the instrument of breakthrough. It is what pierces through. It is what makes a difference. It is the instrument in the hands of God. Let me give you some illustrations of this from the word. Sometimes people feel like they can't break through in the area of sin. Oh yeah, you got saved, born again, God touched your life, things were going good, things were going great, but how many of you like Pastor Dan, after a while of being saved, all of a sudden that old sin raised up its ugly head and you thought, I thought you were gone. I, I thought we were done. You know, I had broken off this relationship. What are you doing back here? And all of a sudden, here you are, you find it, and you feel bad about it. You repent before the Lord, and, you know, you're going on. And then after a little while, here it comes again. What, you know, what's going on here? And so you continue in life, and you continue to go through the process of repentance before God. And yet, here's this thing, and it feels like you're in bondage to this thing. Even though you're a Christian, even though you're reading the Word, even though you're going to church, even though you're studying about it, you're trying to find out about it, what makes the difference? What makes the difference is that if you're going to break through in the area of sin, you've got to apply the word of God. Let me show it to you in the Bible, Psalms, book of Psalms. Turn there with me. I'm going to kind of bounce around in the Old Testament and back to the New Testament a little bit today. But in the book of Psalms, if you hit Job, come back. Psalm 119. And Psalms 119. Really, the whole psalm is about the excellency of the word of God, and it'll bless you just reading it. It's a long psalm, longest psalm in the Bible, longest chapter in the Bible. Well worth the time. But we're going to take a look at one verse today, Psalms 119, verse number 11. Psalms 119, verse number 11 says this. It says, your word have I hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. Your word have I hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. If you want to get breakthrough in the area of sin or any bondage in your life, you are going to have to apply the word of God and hide that word in your heart. Why? Because it is the instrument of breakthrough. And when you put the word of God in your heart, it will keep you from sin. Uh, we were talking about this in between the, the services and Pastor Jim reminded me of a movie where there was a man who was in prison. He was in a cell. There was no way that you could break out. No one had ever broken out of this prison. And this man, through different deals and different things, was trading around and, and, you know, kind of the underground stuff was going on. And eventually he obtained just a teeny little tool that was used for carving, used for art, and used for sculpture and that sort of a thing. And he got a hold of that instrument, and there in his prison cell, he, he, he started to chip away at the wall. And he put a poster up over that place where he was chipping away so that no one would know what he was doing. And every night he would roll that poster back and he would chip away. And he would use that little tool and he would just kind of chip, 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 chip. And, and, and every day he would take those things and he would kind of hide them in his pant pocket, you know. And then when he got out to the yard, he would kind of kick that dirt out little by little. And after a while, he had broken through. He had made it to the other side, and now he had opened up a hole where he could actually be released from his prison cell, and he was the only one who was able to break out and stay out because he had that little tool in his hand. Sometimes you and I, in our battle against sin, we are in bondage and we're in a prison. And here we are, and we're saying, I don't understand how does this little tool apply to my life. And yet God says, I want you to get a hold of a scripture. I want you to start to declare the word of God that I've already declared over your life. And as you do, you take that one little scripture, that little tool in your life, and you start to chip away, and you start to go after it, and you start to get after it, and you keep a picture in front of you of hope, and eventually you're going to break through, and you will be free in every area of your life as you apply the word. It's the instrument of breakthrough. How about another one? Well, in the area of our health, sometimes people say, I'm struggling with my health. I can't get over this health issue. I can't get over this health problem. Listen, it's time to apply the word of God for your breakthrough in the area of your health. Many times people are in bondages and, and having problems that they can have breakthrough. And they're waiting on something that they could have. You're there in Psalm 119. Take a look at Psalms 107, a couple pages back. Psalms 107. We're going to take a look at verse number 20, but verse number 19 describes the, the condition of the people and saying that they cried out to the Lord in their troubles and he saved them out of their distresses. Now let's see how God did this. 
Psalms 107, verse number 20 says this. He sent his word and healed them. And delivered them from their destructions. See, if you are looking for healing, if you are looking for deliverance, it's time to get a hold of the word of God and start to cut through, start to break through in the air of your health. It's time to start going after it. And every time you feel those symptoms coming back, every time you feel that thing coming back on you, you start to declare the word of God, start to declare the promise of God. I thank God for our doctors. I thank God for modern medicine, that sort of thing. It's helped a lot of people and done a lot of good. And I'm not telling you not to listen to your doctor. I'm not telling you not to take your medication, but I'm telling you additionally, first and foremost, the priority is to declare the word of God. God's word is his medicine. Therefore, you apply that first in the spiritual, and you'll see breakthrough in the natural. Okay, what about this? Sometimes people are saying, I just can't succeed in life. I, I, it just seems like I'm always behind, never have enough. I just can't prosper in my life. I just can't get there. I can't do it. I, I, it just seems like the whole world is against me, just keeping me down. Well, listen, the word of God, when used in your life, will give you breakthrough for success. Let me show it to you. There, you're there in the Psalms. Turn to the sixth book of the Bible, the book of Joshua. If you start at Genesis, go through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then the next book there is Joshua. Joshua chapter number one, Joshua was the leader that came up after Moses. God raised him up to lead the nation of Israel into the promised land. Joshua had seen many great things, miracles, signs, and wonders. He had seen great deliverance by the Lord. He'd seen battles won. Now here he is. All of this had been under the leadership of Moses. And so here he is taking on a huge responsibility. I mean, can you imagine the leadership of a nation taking them into a conquest of a land that has fortified cities and giants in it? So here he is facing these things in his life, and he's about ready to go into the promised land, and he wants to succeed. And, and I get the picture of God just sitting him down and talking to him, just ministering to him. God is building him up. God is encouraging him before he sends him into the land. And take a look at what God says to Joshua. Joshua chapter number one, verse number eight. He starts out and he says, this book of the law. Now stop right there and look up at me for a second. You've got to remember at this time, the only inspired word of God that Joshua had was the first five books of the Bible. Because Moses had written down what God had told him to write down, and so therefore Moses penned those first five books. And that was called the book of the law. And so God says to Joshua, this book of the law. See, the word that he had was more than enough for every need. God says, this book of the law, what? Shall not depart from your mouth there's that second witness God had already spoken it but now he's saying Joshua I want you to be that double edge I want you to be that second mouth come in agreement by speaking it this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth you are to declare the word of God Joshua you are to speak it out of your mouth Joshua look at what he says but you shall meditate now sometimes we see a word like meditate and we say well is that like that weird new age transcendental meditation where you um and you do all that kind of no listen that's foolishness it's not what this is talking about this is talking about you shall meditate, really a, a, a word that we could understand to, to translate this word would be to mutter, to mutter, right? To speak it. See, it, it shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it. You shall mutter it. You shall speak it. Say it over and over again. The picture that we get is a cow chewing on its cud, right? Here's a cow that, that goes and gets a bite of grass, right, and starts to chew it, right? Starts to bite after it, swallows it down. You don't see the cow take another bite of the grass, but all of a sudden, the cow's chewing again. What happened? He brought it back up and started to chew. That's kind of gross, but that's what they do, all right? It's a cow. And the cow will swallow it back down. After a while, it brings it back up and starts to chew on it again. What's it doing? It's getting every bit of nutrition, every bit of what it can out of this grass that it's eating. It's drawing on it. It's pulling out of it what it needs. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it. You shall chew on it. You shall mutter it. You shall bring it up over and over again. How often? Day and night. Day and night. See, sometimes you, you get a hold of a promise of God. You read it maybe in the morning. You say, that's for me. That, that verse is for me. And you declare it there in the morning. About partway through the day, you get to work. Boss starts getting on your case. Coworker starts talking about you behind your back. You start to wonder about the bills. You, you realize it's the first, and hey, what am I going to do? My goodness, I got all this stuff stacked up again. What do you do? You bring that promise back up. You start to chew on it again. You start to, to speak it to yourself. Start to say it so that you can hear it. Middle of the night, you go to bed. You wake up in the middle of the night, and that issue is back on your mind. You bring it back up. 
Just like we were saying, sometimes people who are dealing with physical sicknesses, they declare the word of God, they get some freedom. I feel better. Oh, my goodness, the pain is gone. I can move again. And then all of a sudden, oh, whoa, whoa, there it is again. What do you do? You start to declare the promise of God again. You bring it back up again. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. See, when we get the word of God in our heart, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. When you get the word of God in your heart, it starts to work its way out into your life, into your actions. Let's take a look at the rest of the verse, Joshua 1.8. For then you will make your way prosperous. Now hold on, wait a second, wait a second. We've been waiting for God to make us prosperous. We've been waiting for God to do something. We've been waiting for God to just rain dewdrops from heaven on us or have a goose fly over and lay a golden egg or something like that. Why hasn't the tree sprouted out in the backyard that has the golden apples? Listen, God is saying, I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I've already given you everything you need. Jesus went to the cross. He was resurrected. I sent you the spirit of God and you have my word. You've got what you need. You've got what it takes. Then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. See, God's not interested in you just having success. He wants you to have good success. God doesn't give you average worldly success. No, that's not what this is about. This is about you having godly success because good is what God says. Therefore, God says when you use the word and you apply the word of God, then you will get the godly result. Then you will have good success. Are you listening today? When we use the word, it is the instrument of breakthrough, number one thing for today. Secondly, for today, when we use the word, it is, number two, a sword. When we use the word, number two, it is a sword. Now, we've heard some great teaching in this church from our pulpit about the word of God and the sword of the word of God and the picture of it. And we find it in Ephesians chapter 6. Turn there with me. Back to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter number 6. We find... The spiritual armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 talking about we don't have a physical fight that we're in. This is a spiritual battle that we're in. You are to put on your spiritual armor and take your stand. Put on that, that breastplate of righteousness. You, you are to wrap yourself, gird yourself about, hold yourself together with truth, right? You, you are to put on the preparation of the gospel of peace on your feet. Put your shoes on. Get ready to run with the gospel. Get ready to go tell someone about Jesus. You are to have that helmet of salvation. Take up the shield of faith. Extinguish those darts of the enemy that he's throwing at you that are fiery, right? He's shooting these flaming arrows at you all the time. You raise up that shield. Lift up that shield, church. But look at what it says in Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 17 and verse number 18. It says, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse number 18 There is no period in between these two verses. I want you to notice, it was not written in chapter and verse. This was a letter. This was one complete thought. And sometimes we say, well, I've got my spiritual armor on, and I'm standing, but what do I do? We don't know what to do. But God didn't want you to get your armor on and go sit on the couch. Channel surf. That's not what you do in armor. God didn't want you to get your armor on and just go hang out by the pool, relax. No, you are in a war. This is a spiritual battle. There is opposition. And the very fact that you are made in the image of God means that the devil hates your guts. And the devil is coming against you. He is all up in your business, if I could say it in San Bernardino terms for some of y'all. Hello. But he says, I want you to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Verse number 18, the first word is praying. Praying. With all prayer and supplication. Prayer is talking to God. And so God says, if you are going to take up your spiritual armor and you're going to go fight a battle, I want you to start to declare the word of God in your prayers. Not just asking God for things, but to also declare the word of God. Take up that sword of the spirit in your prayer time and start to raise it up and start to declare the word of God. And listen, God's already spoken it. Now you're coming into agreement. You are that second witness on the earth. You are that second mouth. And now when you declare the word of God, that sword of the spirit goes forth. (laughs) Praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication 
for the saints. Listen, the enemy is present. Draw your sword. In fact, I don't have it up on the overheads for you, but Jeremiah chapter number 48, verse 10, the second part of that says, Cursed is everyone who keeps his sword from blood. God wants us to draw our sword and enter the battle. In the book of Psalms 149, verse number 6, I'll put it up on the overheads for you. It says, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. See, this is not something that we are to treat casually. This is not something that is just a book that's supposed to collect dust on your nightstand or that you wake up and you pat in the morning and say, I'm very glad that I... No, you are to pick this thing up, get it in your heart, and then you are to declare it out of your mouth and use your sword. In fact, a, a brilliant understanding of this sword of the Spirit, when the Apostle Paul was writing to the Ephesians, he talked about this sword of the Spirit. Now, we think sword, we just think sword, right? We think maybe broad sword, you know, like Mel Gibson had playing William Wallace in, in Braveheart, right? This big two-handed sword that's as tall as he is, right? And he can just, right, and just take out the enemy. Not the kind of sword he's talking about. Sometimes we think about a sword, we think about Excalibur, right? This is the word of God. This is Excalibur. Only a king could pick this up, right? And it's this massive sword that they take out of the rock. And it's this huge sword, right? And it's got supernatural power. Not, not what he's talking about. Not what he's talking about. In fact, he used a very specific word called makira. Now, the makira was a short little sword. Probably maybe about this long. Little teeny tiny, kind of like a dagger, we would say. But really, it was, it was a, a short sword, and it was used for close combat. And the picture that he was using was from the Roman army. Now, the Romans, these guys were trained killers. Their armies were, were, were trained for battle. And they had a very specific way of going into battle. See, the Romans, even though they may have had shields and they had spears and they had bow and arrow, all that, they didn't want to use that. No, they wanted to use the makira. That was their, their goal in war, was that they were wanting to get close enough to the enemy to get in close range and pull out that sword and use that sword. That was what the Romans wanted to do. They didn't want to go up against a spear. They didn't want to go up against bow and arrow. They didn't want to go up against any long range or long sword. They wanted to get up close and personal in the battle. Now, remember, we already said the devil's all up in your business. The devil's already right here in your face. The devil is at close range. And so you don't have time to pull out the long sword and sweep it across. You don't have time to pull out your bow and arrow. No, no, that's not what this is about. The devil is present the enemy is at hand and it's time to take out that little dagger and see what the romans would do is they would get in close proximity and they knew that if they could confuse their enemy and they could get up and just just come up and take that makira that little sword and they could just stab and then they would draw back right so they wouldn't get hurt back and then they would run up and they would stab again and then they, they would draw back and every time they would come in for a stab they may only get like one inch two inches into the person that they were fighting but they knew that one or two inches could prove fatal all they had to do was break through that chain mail. They had to use their makira, their little short dagger-like sword, and they had to just get that quick little word, that little breakthrough, and they could defeat their enemy. Isn't that what Jesus did? You remember Jesus being tempted by Satan there in the wilderness? And the devil comes up and tempts him. Oh, if you're the son of God, make these stones. What does Jesus do? Devil, it is written. He pulls out that little word, that little one little tiny scripture that we find in the word of God. He breaks out that short little sword, bam, and he hits the devil with it. Devil comes back again, he pulls it out, it is written, bam, and he gets him again. Devil comes up once again, and he pulls it out away from me, Satan, for it is written, bang, one little verse, and sends the devil running. Yeah. Hallelujah. You and I, when it comes to our fight, we are to take up the sword of the Spirit. God will give you a word of God. Maybe it's just a little short, little teeny tiny word. Maybe all you can remember is God is able. That's all you got. God is able. Or maybe it's in Him. I am in Him. I have value in Him. I am in Jesus. Sometimes all you got is just one little short phrase. That's all you need. That's your short little sword, your makira that you break out and you send the enemy running. When we use the word, a couple of things we looked at already. When we use the word, it is number one, the instrument of breakthrough. Number two, it is a sword. And number three, last thing for today, when we use the word, it is like a scalpel. When we use the word, it is like a scalpel. Now, we've already talked about the, the double-edged sword being two-mouthed, right? We've already talked about that understanding, God speaking, that we speak it. But not only does that word go out, but there's another edge that 
comes in. You and I have to realize and understand that the word of God, even though we may send it out, even though we can overcome, even though we can send it into circumstances, we can send it into areas of our life, we can send it into the enemy and send him running, that that same word will also pierce us. Just like the prophet said to Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul also. We have to be wise enough to understand that this word will come in like a surgeon's scalpel. And God will do heart surgery on you and I. God wants to get on the inside of you and God wants to get his word deep down on the inside of you and God wants to change us and rearrange us and make us and conform us into the image of his son. And the way that he does that, the instrument that he uses is the word of God. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, in the message paraphrase, it says this. It says, God means what he says. What he says goes. His powerful word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel. Cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one is impervious to God's word. We can't get away from it no matter what. Oftentimes when you speak the word of God, when you come into church, you hear the word of God. It cuts you deep into your heart. Can't get away from it. Can't get it off your mind. Can't get it. It's ringing in your ears and you just know that the word of God. See, oftentimes people come to me and say, Pastor, you know what? I heard God say this. It was something that, that wasn't even said from the pulpit area of this church. People have started ministries. People have done things in this church because they heard the word of God. And it wasn't even from what was said in the pulpit. What's going on? The word of God is cutting through. The word of God is getting on the inside of people. The word of God is now piercing and penetrating and getting in and taking root and then bearing fruit in their lives. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, we see, if you want to turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2, right after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter number 2, we see a scene that the church is birthed, literally on the steps to the temple. Here, the people are praying in the upper room. Spirit of God blows into the room. Tongues of fire are divided amongst them. They start to speak in other tongues. They run out and declare the praises of God and the glory and goodness of God. As they're running out, people are hearing the high praise of God in their own language. People start to mock. A crowd gathers and they say, all these men are drunk. Peter gets up and he preaches the first sermon there on the day of Pentecost. And he starts to talk to them. He says, these guys aren't drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, you guys. Come on. People get drunk at night. This is not what's going on. This, what you see, is what was spoken by the prophet, and he starts to declare the word of God that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What's he doing? He's breaking open the word of God. He's using that instrument. He's breaking out that tool of breakthrough, breaking out that sword, and starts to declare the word of God. And then he starts to talk about what King David had said. Starts to talk about how Jesus Christ was crucified. Take a look at what happens. The people are here listening. They hear the very first sermon. They hear the word of God being preached, word of God being spoken. And in Acts chapter number 2, verse number 37, Acts chapter 2, verse number 37, it says, Now when they, who's they? Well, the people that were listening to the sermon. When they heard this, heard what? Heard the word of God. When they heard this, they were cut to the hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Do. In other words, you just cut me open, now can you sew me back up? Oftentimes when you come to church, you feel like that. My goodness, what, wait a second. D did the preacher have my house bugged? He just read my mail. People are shrinking down in their seats, trying not to move so that no one will notice them. He's talking about me right now. Don't know if you all know, but he's talking about me. And what's going on? The word of God is going forth, and it's like that surgeon's scalp on it's opening up. In fact, the, the picture that we get in the book of Hebrews, because in, in Hebrews chapter 5, it starts to talk about the high priest, Jesus being our high priest. The real picture is of the high priest taking that knife, that instrument that he used to slay the sacrifice, and then to cut the sacrifice into pieces and arrange and order it there on the altar. When that priest would cut that sacrifice, it would open up and expose what was on the inside of that animal. And it would cut through, and as he would cut through, like one of the things you see is that the, the shoulder of the animal was laid up for the priest oftentimes in the, in the, in the offerings. And so he would cut it and he would arrange it there on, on the altar. And so as he would cut it, it would cut through bone and marrow and show what was on the inside. 
The same way the word of God, when it gets into our hearts, sometimes we say, what's going on in here? What's, is that just me or is that God? What's going to determine that for your life is the word of God. Because as the word of God gets in, it is a discerner of the thoughts and of the intents of the heart. It opens it up. It exposes it. Just like the high priest cutting that animal exposed and showed the bone and the marrow. Now here comes the word of God discerning between soul and spirit. It will show you if it's just you or if it's really God, if it lines up with the word of God. Love what uh, Charles Spurgeon, he was called the Prince of Preachers back in the 1800s in England. He preached a message called the sword of the spirit. I thought it applied to you and I today. He says these words. He says, the word of God in the hand of the spirit wounds very terribly. It makes the heart of man to bleed. Do you not remember some of you when you used to be gashed with this sword Sunday after Sunday? Were you not cut to the heart by it so as to be angry with it? You almost made up your mind to turn away from hearing the gospel again. That sword pursued you and pierced you in the secrets of your soul and made you bleed in a thousand places. At last you were pricked to the heart and then the execution was done indeed. That wound was deadly and none but he that killed could make you alive. Do you recollect how after this your sins were slain one after another? Their necks were laid on the block and the spirit acted as executioner with his sword. After that, your fears and doubts and despair and unbelief were also hacked to pieces by this same sword. The word gave you life, but it was at first a great killer. Your soul was like a battlefield after a great fight under the first operations of the divine spirit whose sword returns not empty from the conflict. Word of God is that surgeon's scalpel that gets deep into the recesses of your heart, into the inmost places, and opens you up and exposes what's going on on the inside. And then it's like that seed that takes root on the inside of you and then bears fruit in your life. What did we learn today about the piercing word of God? Number one, we learned that when we use the word, it is the instrument of breakthrough. Don't wait for breakthrough. Get a hold of your breakthrough. Start to declare the promise of God. Start to declare the word of God. Get your breakthrough. When we use the word, it's number two, a sword. It is the sword of the spirit that we are to declare. We are to come in and use that short sword. Even if all you got is one word, man, God is able. Even if you got one word, one little scripture that you're standing on, that is more than enough to send the enemy and the opposition packing. And finally, when we use the word, it is like a scalpel. It gets deep down on the inside of your heart, exposes things, opens things up, does surgery on your heart, and then it puts you back together the right way again. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, let's give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo. Let's not stop there. I want you to just take a moment. Nobody get up, no one leave. During this time, this is important. Your eternal destiny is at stake. I want to make sure that before you leave this place, that your heart is right with God so that if you died, you'd go to heaven and you wouldn't end up in hell. It'd be a tragedy if we came into the house of God, sang the songs of God, and experienced his presence, heard the word of God, and you did today. You guys were wonderful, like I said. It'd be a tragedy if all that happened, you walked out of this place, your heart wasn't right with God, you died and went to hell. I don't want that to happen to you. You don't want that to happen to you. And listen, most of all, God doesn't want that to happen to you. Hell was never created for you and I. It was created for the devil and his angels that rebelled against God. And yet you and I can choose where we end up, whether we go to heaven or where, whether we go to hell. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, you know, I don't believe in hell. And therefore, I'm not going to go to hell because, you know, I don't think it's real. Well, listen, that's like saying, well, I don't believe in Mack trucks. Go stand out on the slow lane of the freeway. You'll meet one face to face sooner or later. Because the Bible talks about hell. Old and New Testament, Jesus talked about it. And hell is a very real place. And just because you deny something's existence doesn't make it any less real. So come on, let's talk today. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people answer that question. And they say, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven because I've been a really good person my entire life. I've done a lot of good things over my lifetime, helped people out, gave money to charity. I used to be bad, but now I changed my behavior. I've been really good and done a lot of good things. Or maybe you were always good, never been bad, according to your standards or society standards. But listen, could you show that to me in the Bible, how good you have to be in order to get to heaven? Because I don't see anywhere in the Bible that there's a grading scale or a curve that you have to be above, be this good and you get to go to heaven. It, it, it doesn't work like that. In fact, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we compare our good works to God's goodness, it's like filthy rags. What does that mean? It means it's gonna get thrown out. Not gonna make it to heaven just by being good. 
What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. We, we, we went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, Sabbath school class. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck and had you baptized your Christian as a child. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're raised in church. Parents tell you you're Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you go to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized as a Christian as a child, that you get to go to heaven. I don't see anywhere in the word that it says that America is the Christian nation and everybody born in America automatically gets citizenship in heaven and you get to go. It doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. Come on, let's talk today. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say, well, hold on a second. I'm going to get to heaven because not only have I been good and been raised in church, but I'm sitting in church right now. I mean, I, I'm still here and I'm sitting right in front of you. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? Because I attend church. Listen, just show it to me in the Bible, could you? Because nowhere in the Bible says sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Any more than you can go sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. It's foolishness. We understand that. And yet, nowhere in the Bible does it say Sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. A lot of people think, I just go to church, it makes me a Christian. Not true. Sometimes people say, okay, I, I got you on that one. But, but, but listen to this. My last church I got involved, I helped out. Sang in the choir for a number of years. Carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, I'm glad you did those things. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible? Where it says that you help out. Carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, sing in the choir. People think of you as a leader, teach in the Bible classes, that you get to go to heaven. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible do I see God waiting at the gate of heaven, looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. It doesn't work like that. Come on, let's get real. Let's talk today. You're not going to make it. Some of you say, well, wait a second, wait a second. I know God. Somebody told me that if I knew God, that makes me a Christian. I know about Jesus, celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life, sing the songs at Christmas. I could even quote scriptures to you and tell you stories out of the Old and New Testament. I know God. That's great. And once again, very glad that you can do those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible? In fact, if you read your Bible, you would know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven and denying hell, even though... He can quote scriptures in the Bible. Everybody look up at me for a moment. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that qualifies you for heaven. But rather, this is about your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a good guy, raised up in his church, got involved. In fact, he became one of the leaders of that day. He could quote the scripture. He could preach the scripture. He could debate the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? Did a lot of good deeds in his day. And yet when Jesus comes to Nicodemus, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals. But this is not about what society says. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible... It's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. If you haven't done that, you're not going to make it. But come on, today, let's change that. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to this church today. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, your call, your choice. We give him all of your heart, we give him all of your life. 
Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you. And if you deny me, I will deny you. So I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment to do just that. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'll pop my hands together just like this. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang. That's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. But get over it. Why do I say that? Because think of it. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that train. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. You can get right with God in this safe, friendly place by simply raising your hand. I'll count it. You put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than being in hell. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man. I'll see your hand. He says, I'll confess you. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. You can get right with God or you can sit there and do nothing. You choose. God's already done everything he's going to do. He sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. He's raised again to life so that you and I could live with him offers you and I forgiveness of sins and life eternal with him. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise your hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure before you leave this place. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise your hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know, that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, get ready to get your hand up in this safe, friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or you're watching the live stream, you can raise your hand and then tell an usher, or you can come into the church service right afterwards, or if you're watching online, you can click the button that says respond to God, and it will lead you. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. Four, thank you. There's five. Thank you. Up on top, six. Thank you. Seven, gotcha. God bless you. Eight, thank you. Over here on this side, where you at? Just give me a little wave. Is that back there? Thank you. Thank you. There's nine right there. Up on top, anybody up there? There's 10, gotcha. 11, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, 12, thank you. 13, 14, 15. Thank you. I got those guys up there. Thank you. Anybody else? 15, 16, 17. 18 in the family room. God bless you. Gotcha. Anybody in this family room over here? All right. We got about 18. Where are you at? Number 19. You're sitting there wondering if you should. You should. Come on. Go for it. Just pop it up real high. Thank you. Thank you. Number 19. Hey, where are you at? 20. Come on. Let's go for Jesus today. Number 20. I don't see it. Just wave it at me if that's you up there. Give me a little wave. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Where are you at? Number 20. Come on. You're sitting there wondering if you should. You should. Go for it. Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about 19 wise people. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All 19 of you, or if you're number 20, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap. Elijah's going to sing a song for us. As we do that, I want you to get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Come on, let's stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just come on down. Make your way to the front. You come. Lord, I give you my come on, let's give them a hand as they come. You can come. Come on. Give no one leave during this time. Let them come. Hallelujah. Look at this. Come on, come on, come on. Every breath that I take. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Lord, have your They're coming. They're coming from the family rooms. You can bring your kids. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. They're still coming. You can come too. Come on. Just get out of your seat. Make your way to the front right now. That I take every moment I'm away. Everybody else, if you need to come, come on. Lord, have your way. Hallelujah. All right. Hey, everybody up front, take a look up here. Do what I'm doing. Put a smile on your face, all right? This is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, okay? The old man is the one that's dying. There's a new man coming to life right now, and that's a good thing, okay? This is the best decision of your entire life. Now, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here. See this guy in the red shirt waving over there? That's Pastor Dave. 
Pastor Dave is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? Uh, you know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Are they going to do some weird stuff to me? What's good? No, listen, he's cool. It, it, it's, it's easy, okay? He's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are in advance. He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Give you some free stuff. Okay, a little booklet our pastor wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Okay, you need to invest maybe a half hour, sit down and read it. Find out what to do next, okay? And then thirdly, he's gonna introduce you to a friend we have in the church called a spiritual personal trainer, okay? Now, he'll describe how the program works. It's easy, it's free, you need to do it, okay? If you'll just give us one year of your life, commit to the things of God, your life will explode and it will just knock your socks off. Let me say it like that, okay? But you've got to get in there and you've got to get a hold of the Word of God. And SPT is that friend that will help you to do that, okay? The program doesn't take a year, but it gets you started on that year, all right? He'll describe how it works and then I'll let you come right back out. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah! Woo!